more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast welcome you to the Texaco Star Theater. For the next hour, the Texaco Star Theater presents two complete units of top radio entertainment. Our variety show, originating in Hollywood, stars Ken Murray, Francis Langford, and Kenny Baker, with Irene of Tim and Irene. Music is by David Brookman and his orchestra. The guest of honor, Edgar Rice Burroughs, author of the world-famous Tarzan of the Apes. Following the variety half hour, you will hear from New York a radio adaptation of Claire Cummer's comedy triumph, Her Master's Voice, starring Edward Everett Horton and Lucille Watson. We start our full hour of variety and drama in the Texaco Star Theater with David Brookman and his orchestra playing Good Morning. Spotlight focuses Mr. on... Arlington. Oh, hello, Irene. What can I do for you? Is Edgar Rice Burroughs really going to be on the program tonight? That's right. Oh, can't you just see him wrapped up in a tiger skin rug, riding piggyback on a crocodile, eating peanuts right out of an elephant's hand and swinging through the trees by his tail? Who are you talking about, Ken Murray? Yeah, I don't think that's very funny. <laughs> Kenny, you're getting to be a falsetto Ned Sparks. If you must know what they're talking about, it was Tarzan. You certainly know Tarzan. Why, did he say he knew me? <laughs> Kenny, look. Look, just picture a tall, dark, muscular man swinging between trees. Now, what does that make you think of? Joe Lewis in a hammock. <laughs> don't, don't mind Kenny, folks. He's been buying so many sport outfits lately, he's slack happy. <laughs> Gee, Ken, you'd make a wonderful Tarzan. I would. Oh, now listen, Irene, what is this all, this Tarzan stuff anyway? Well, the girls in your Kingston fan club are starting a campaign to make you the next Tarzan. Oh, Irene. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our slogan is, uh, back to the bushes for Murray. <laughs> <laughs> the girls all think that you'd make a wonderful Tarzan. <laughs> Me, Tarzan? <laughs> oh, that's silly, Irene. <laughs> Well, still, all the girls can't be wrong. <laughs> Certainly they can't, Ken. I think you'd be a marvelous Tarzan. Really, Francis? Sure. In my hometown, everybody says you're a great actor. Why, they think you're another Mickey Rooney. Yeah. <laughs> sure, Ken, everybody in my town raves about your acting, too. Really, Kenny? Everybody? All except my cousin. He made one remark about your acting, but I said you did not. <laughs> got to do with playing Tarzan. I still think you'd be wonderful. Well, I, I suppose you have seen worse-looking physiques than mine, haven't you? Haven't you? Well, wait a minute. We're trying to think. Now, Irene, not that I care a don about playing Tarzan, but you must admit that I was an all-around athlete back home in Kingston. Certainly. Remember the time you won the annual swimming race at Kingston High School? <laughs> Do I remember? <laughs> mm. And they disqualified you for wearing an inner tube around your waist under the bathing suit? <laughs> and they were sorry later when they found out it wasn't an inner tube. Yeah, you were just built that way. <laughs> 
<laughs> Nevertheless, Irene, I'm st- I was still the best swimmer in town. Were you? <laughs> if I remember right, the boys used to call you Sinky. That's not true. What they called me was... Well, maybe it was Sinky. <laughs> would be so thrilled if you could get Mr. Burroughs to let you play Tarzan. Why, kid, you're not scared to work in a jungle, are you? Oh, scared? <laughs> not me. But think how my mother would worry about me. Exposed to all those jungle dangers, lions, tigers, panthers, Dorothy L'Amour. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, personally, I think my mother takes the wrong attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's right. It. <laughs> I don't think we need to. <laughs> that night, it's Dorothy Lamour's mother should wor- should worry. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly fix that up, Kenny. I know what's wrong with you, Kenny. You're just timid. You change your mind if you ever put your arm around a girl. Oh, I do that. You do? Sure. You put your arm around them, and then what do you do? Then I guess their weight. <laughs> And I care not for fame or renown Like a black sheep of old I'll come back to the fold Little town in the old county down Had the wings of a swallow, I would travel far over the sea. Then a rocky old road I would follow to a spot that is heaven to me. When the sun goes to rest way down in the west, then I'll build such a nest in the place I love best. Oh, that dear little town in the old county down, it will linger way down in my heart. Though it never was grand, tis my fairy land, just a wonderful world set apart. Oh, my island of dreams, you are with me, it seems, and I care not for fame or renown, like a black. really was swell. By, by the way, Kenny, have you heard the latest story about the three little bears? Pardon me, Ken, that's my line. Yours, Jimmy? Yeah, why, I thought your line was Texaco gasoline. It is. Listen. Have you heard the latest story about the three little bears? You'll see them on the highway climbing the Texaco road sign as a friendly reminder to motorists that colder weather's on the way. So don't hibernate. Insulate. Let a Texaco dealer get your car ready for winter now. For easier, safer starting... Have a Texaco dealer rid your crankcase of dirty, worn, weakened oil. A change to insulated Haviland or Texaco motor oil will renew the safe protection of your engine. For these new style oils are insulated against both heat and cold. For easier gear shifting, have him drain the heavy-grade summer lubricants from the transmission and rear end 
save wear and tear by refilling with winter-grade Texaco gear lubricant. Finally, for easier riding, let him complete the winter protection of your car by giving it Texaco's 40-point lubrication service with Marfac. Marfac, spelled M-A-R-F-A-K, is Texaco's famous chassis lubricant that lasts twice as long as ordinary grease. So don't hibernate, insulate. See your Texaco dealer tomorrow. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest star, a man... Say, Mr. Murray, did you ask him yet? You know, about Tarzan. Oh, Irene, please. No, quiet. I have an introduction to make. I know, but he's the man to ask about Tarzan. This is not the time to be pushed out on a limb. Ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) we have with us tonight the man who conceived a character who holds front rank in the popular fiction of our time, the creator of Tarzan, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Thank you, Ken. Well, Mr. Burroughs, it isn't very often that we have the most popular writer in the world on our program. Well, Ken, I'd hardly call myself that. Oh, 25 million copies can't be wrong. But tell us, how did it all happen? Well, Tarzan started off as a thing to keep two bookends apart. And the first thing you know, the darn thing got away from me. (laughs) But, uh, Mr. Burroughs, we we don't care how it started. Believe me, it must be a tough life you lead, scouting around the African jungle looking for material. Confidentially, Ken, I've never been to Africa in my life. Now, wait a minute. You, You mean you write about places you've never been to? How about those Mars books? You're not going to stand there and tell me that you have No, never... Ken, I'm ashamed of it. I feel like an old stay-at-home. <laughs> Boy, it must be swell on Mars. Kenny, nobody's ever been on Mars. You mean to say that Buck Rogers stuff is fiction? <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, this is our guest, Edgar Rice Burroughs, the father of Tarzan. Well, congratulations, Mr. Burroughs. Are you handing out cigars? <laughs> Don't pay any attention to him, Mr. Burroughs. When he was born, nature declared a brain embargo. Oh, hey, Ken. What? Go on and ask him. Irene, shh. Well, go ahead and ask him. All right. What's all the right. matter, Ken? Oh, nothing. It's nothing at all. I was just talking to my people here. Go away. Uh, you know, Mr. Burroughs, of all the books you've written, uh, I believe I like the Tarzan series the best. Hello, a boy, Ken. Yes, <laughs> You know, I've followed Tarzan in all the comic strips, and I've seen all the movies, and that last one, Tarzan Finds the Sun, that was great. Well, we thought it was pretty good, Ken. Of course, there's always room for improvement. Yes, yes, that's the way I feel about it, too. (laughs) There's one thing, of course, I wouldn't like to suggest. Oh, that's all right, Ken. Tell me. Oh, you you probably think I'm silly or conceited. Not at all, Ken. Go right ahead. Well, how about this fellow Weissmuller? Are you completely satisfied with him? (laughs) I, I, I thought maybe somebody else, you know, someone with more, um... Well, we're pretty happy with Johnny. Good hmm. Tarzans are hard to find. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I guess they must be. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Burroughs, I've just had some pictures taken in my bathing trunk. You know, Ken, uh... Tarzan is a powerful he-man. Yeah, that is. Not out of condition and soft like you and I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he, he is, isn't he? <laughs> That's why T- Weissmiller is good. His muscles and his physique haven't gone to pieces yet. <laughs> Whereas you and I... Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I see what you mean. Oh, Mr. Burroughs, don't you think that Ken Murray would make a wonderful Tarzan? Oh, don't pay any attention to him, Mr. Burroughs. Imagine me playing Tarzan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why, he's even been mistaken for Tarzan. Remember at that party, Ken, when you asked that girl to dance and she said, get away, you big ape? <laughs> Irene, for your information, it was Mitt- uh, Mrs. Martin Johnson. And she just said it from force of habit. Oh. Anyway, Mrs. Burroughs. <laughs> or Mr. Burroughs. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Burroughs, I was very much interested in what you said about Africa. How could you write about strange places like that without ever having been to any of them? Purely imagination, Ken. Before I wrote a word, I used to sit around and dream of weird people and weird places just for my own amusement. Really? It's funny. I, I do the same thing. I've written, I've written dozens of stories, in my mind, of course, and I'm always the hero and I always marry the girl. Well, my stories have happy endings. <laughs> 
Anyway, Ken, why don't you try putting some of those things on paper? Well, n- now that you bring it up, as a matter of fact, I have. I, I had an idea for a new story about Tarzan and Jimmy Wallington and Francis Langford are crazy about it. Francis Langford? Somebody calling me? Yeah, Francis, this is Edgar Rice Burroughs. I was telling him about that Tarzan idea I spoke to you about. How do you do, Mr. Burroughs? I've always been a great admirer of your work. And I've always enjoyed your singing very much, Miss Langford. Yes, that's fine. Now, about that idea of mine... Miss I... Langford, I wonder if you'd sing something for us. I'd be delighted. Look, you see, in this idea, I have... What a... idea? Uh, the, the idea about Tarzan, you know. Oh, later, Ken. Go right ahead, Miss Langford. Yeah, go right ahead, Miss Langford. I suppose I'll have to set my idea to music if I want to get any place around here. <laughs> comes a man with the mandolin He'll cheer you up till your ship comes in The music man is coming A happy song he's humming He plays in one key, carries no monkey Throw him a coin and he'll soon begin Bum. Here comes the man with the mandolin. Billy um bum bum, Billy um bum. He'll cheer you up till your ship comes in. Lovable old fella playing an old tune. He comes around every afternoon. Raggedy old minstrel wearing a big grin. You love the man with the mandolin. All the kids follow, all the kids holler to the window above. Mama throw a nickel and the man will pick the little tune we love. Billy um bum bum, Billy um bum. Open your heart, let the music in. Billy um bum bum, Billy um bum. There goes the man with a mandolin. Folks, we do a lot of kidding around on this show, but we have our serious moments, too. Sometimes the change of mood comes as quick as I could say, uh, Jimmy Wellington. Important users of gasoline and lubricants everywhere show a marked preference for Texaco performance and value. For example, in the bus transportation field, Greyhound, the country's largest interstate bus operation, must be sure of quality, power, and economy. Each year, for seven years, they have purchased millions of gallons of Fire Chief gasoline. Greyhound rides with Texaco. TWA flies nearly 10 million miles every year. For eight years, Texaco has met every requirement demanded in the operation of the nation's fastest transcontinental airline schedule. TWA flies with Texaco. The United States Navy is a most critical buyer. Strict governmental tests determine which lubricants are satisfactory for naval use. For four consecutive years, Texaco lubricants have proved they give high efficiency at lowest cost. The United States Navy sails with Texaco. Greyhound on land, TWA in the air, the Navy on the water, each and every one a Texaco user. This, we believe, is the most impressive roll call of any product. This, we believe, is why it will pay you next time to try a Texaco dealer. Say, uh, Mr. Burroughs. Yes, Ken? Now, about this play of mine, uh, Tarzan play. Oh, yes, your play. Mm. Well, Ken, don't forget that plays, pictures, and books about Tarzan are not exactly a novelty to me. But but this is a different Tarzan play. This is Tarzan in his little nest in the treetop. Tarzan when the cameras aren't grinding. 
I call it the home life of Mr. and Mrs. Tarzan, or Apes of Wrath. Go ahead, Jimmy. Set the scene. Ken Murray presents Tarzan. <laughs> Come with us again to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Tarzan in Uganda, Africa, where their only neighbors are the saucer-lipped Yubangis. When last we looked in on Tarzan, Jane, Tarzan's mate, had invited all her relatives to stay with them. Well, how will Tarzan take this? As our scene opens, Tarzan the Mighty, Tarzan the Great Warrior, the fearless Tarzan speaks. Oh, honey, do I have to wash the dishes again? <laughs> yes. And put on your apron. Do you want to ruin your new sarong? <laughs> anyway, don't you talk to me. I'm mad at you. But, honey, I explained about last night. I was sitting up with a sick ape. <laughs> oh, monkey business, huh? <laughs> Probably that bleached blonde, you bangy from the next tree. Fine thing, leaving me here all alone. But you weren't alone, darling. Your father and brother were here. How do you know? Well, the icebox is still here, and they haven't been three feet away from it in seven years. <laughs> now, you shut up. Are you going to do those dishes, or aren't you? I can't. Your father's asleep in the sink. Well, that's your fault for not giving him enough spending money. Not enough spending money? No. I give him $10 every Monday and $10 every Friday. What does he want? $30 every Thursday. <laughs> Daddy dear, wake up, Daddy dear. Poor Daddy dear. He never can sleep in a strange sink. <laughs> you can always count on Daddy for some smart conversation. <laughs> now, you never mind that. Wash those dishes and be careful you don't wash father. Oh, oh, Jane, I wish you wouldn't pick on me. I've had a hard day at the Aquacade. A fine husband you are. You never buy me any decent clothes. That new leopard skin you brought me home scratches. What do you mean it... What do you mean it scratches? You forgot to take the leopard out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I'd stand it if it weren't for my daddy dear and my poor brother dear. <laughs> Hello, sis. What's the missing link done now? <laughs> Okay. Hey, Tars, can you loan me five coconuts? <laughs> five more? What about the ten you borrowed yesterday? I wish you'd leave my past out of this. Yesterday, ten. Today, five. Anyone think coconuts grow on trees? <laughs> I know. I'll bet you've been down to that track at Santa Africa, betting on those antelopes again. Yeah, I guess I'm a sucker. You certainly are. Oh, well, here's your five coconuts. Gee, I guess you're a sucker, too. <laughs> I certainly am. Tarzan, don't stand there gabbing. Get me a cup of flour. I can't. Your father's asleep in the flour barrel. And how I'd like to roll out the barrel. <laughs> oh, I'll bet that's that Mrs. Ubangi from the next tree. She's always coming over here and giving me some of her lip. Well, she's got plenty of it to spare. <laughs> Come in. Hi, y'all. Hello, Francie Lou. Mmm, what are them vittles I smell cooking? Does it smell good, Francie Lou? Mmm. 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 Mrs. Ubangi, quit smacking your lips. <laughs> if you must know, that's real southern fried flamingo. Well, shut my mouth. Shut your mouth? Boy, that's a job for the WPA. <laughs> Quiet, you parasite in the manger. Won't you uh, stay for dinner, Francie Lou? I can't on account of we got a special occasion over to our house. My husband bumped into a couple of explorers today, and we're having them for dinner. Can't you all come over? Uh, well, uh, why can't you uh, bring your explorer friends over here? Oh, I couldn't take them out of the oven now. <laughs> oh, before I forget it, I brought over a little snack from last night's dinner. Won't you try it, Mr. Tarzan? Sure, thanks. Hmm, Dr. Livingston, I presume. <laughs> well, I gotta be running along now, but before I go, can I ask you one favor, Tarzan? Sure, what is it, Fancy Lou? Will you stop using my lower lip for an ashtray? <laughs> well, so long, everybody. I saw you flirting with that Fancy Lou. How dare you? But, darling, I... Don't you strike me! Oh, I feel faint. Quick, give me a glass of water. I can't. Your father's asleep in the water cooler. <laughs> now you've done it. You see what you've done? You've awakened father. Poor daddy, dear.
dear, I'll sing you a lovely, soft lullaby. Oh, turn it down! is the fate of Tarzan. Will he be eaten by the lion, or will Tarzan eat the lion? Tune in again tomorrow night, and if you find out, let us know. Well, Mr. Burroughs, what do you think of my interpretation? I'm at a loss for words, Ken. Incredible is as close as I can come to it. <laughs> See, I knew you'd love it. <laughs> Telegram for Mr. Murray. Telegram. Now, right here, boy. Say, Ken, who is the wire from? Uh, probably some big producer. I'm so nervous, I can't read it. Here, you take it. It is from a producer. And it says, just heard your performance and would like to use you as the star of my next Tarzan picture. Oh, hey, isn't that wonderful? Oh, I knew he'd make it. See, I told you, folks. Isn't that swell, Mr. Burris? Well, looks like we're going to work together after all. Tell me, if I star in the picture, what are you going to call it? Tarzan goes to pot. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Burroughs, for dropping over tonight. And now, back in their true characters, Kenny Baker and Francis Lankford join in a duet to bring us the vocal beauty of Blue Room. All my future plans, dear, will suit your plans. Read the little blue friend. Here's your mother's room, here's your brother's room. On the wall of true friends. Here's the kitty's room, here's the biddy's room. Here's a pantry lined with shelves, dear. Here you plan for us, something grand for us. Where we two can be ourselves, dear. We'll have a blue room, a new room for two rooms. Where every day is a holiday, because I'm married to you. Not like a ballroom. A room, a hall room, where, where I can smoke your pipe away with my wee head upon your knee. We will thrive on, keep alive on, just nothing but kisses with Mr. and Mrs. Ken Murray directing your attention to our dramatic half hour from New York under the expert guidance of Burns Mantle, the play Her Master's Voice, starring Edward Everett Horton and Lucille Watson. Take it away, New York. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
This is New York. The more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast offer this timely advice to weather-wise motorists. Don't hibernate, insulate. Protect your car for winter driving now. Tonight, the Texaco Star Theater welcomes you again to another dramatic presentation from Broadway, Heart of the World Theater. As is our custom, Texaco dealers will not interrupt tonight's performance by any commercial message. Here is Burns Mantle, distinguished Broadway drama critic, who will tell you about the play and its stars. Mr. Mantle. <clears throat> Good evening. As Ken Murray told you, the play tonight is Her Master's Voice. The co-stars are Edred, Edward Everett Horton, Lucille Watson, and Elizabeth Patterson. The stage scene tonight is interesting. Sitting over here is Mr. Horton, a little nervously contemplating the microphone and waiting for me to give it up. Mr. Horton was born in Brooklyn, which makes Brooklyn proud, and his early stage years were partly devoted to light opera. He is, as you know, returning to the stage after many successful years in pictures. Last summer, he starred in Springtime for Henry, and will continue with that play on tour. Over there is Lucille Watson, who also is just back from Hollywood, where she made the usual Watson hit in the picture of the women. We in New York have come to believe that any play with Lucille Watson in it is pretty sure to be a good play. Her more recent successes have been scored in No More Ladies, Pride and Prejudice, and Yes, My Darling Daughter. Near me is Elizabeth Patterson, who came flying back from Hollywood to play tonight her original role of the mother-in-law in Her Master's Voice. She, too, is one of our Broadway favorites, and her recent success in the picture Sing You Sinners has greatly pleased us. Miss Patterson was born in Tennessee, but she got her stage training in, of all places, Paris, France. She was one of the original Washington Square players in New York, and that organization later became the Theater Guild. Claire Comer's comedy, Her Master's Voice, was a happy first night experience, and Broadway still remembers it. But tonight's play is about to begin. Her Master's Voice with Edward Everett Horton as Ned Farrar, Lucille Watson as Aunt Min, and Elizabeth Patterson playing her original role of Mrs. Martin. Our comedy begins in a small suburban town, in the home of Ned Farrar, wherein we meet. But here's Ned himself to tell you about that. May I do the honors? Thank you. Starting with myself, of course, I'm Ned Farrar, the irresponsible father of two children, the inconsiderate husband of Queena, and the unemployed son-in-law of Mrs. Ellie Martin. Queena, that's my wife, you know, and my mother-in-law, are very worried about what Queena's rich aunt men will think of my being out of a job. Oh, dear rich aunt men... I've never had the pleasure of meeting her. She's avoided me ever since I married Queena and spoiled Queena's chances for an operatic career. Ah, oh, poor Queena. Maybe she should have listened to her rich Aunt Min. I'm sure she felt that way tonight when we were all sitting around worrying. Oh, Ned, I do wish there was something I could do to help. But I can't do anything but sing. And I can't even do that anymore. Isn't that right, Mama? Well, of course you can sing, Queena. Look at all those music lessons your Aunt Min paid for when she sent you to Venice. Now, if I were you, I'd go and see Mr. Twilling. Mr. Twilling? You mean Ned's old boy? Why not? He's the head of this new radio network thing. I was reading about it in the paper only this morning. You do think he'd like Queen's voice, don't you, Ned? No. Ned? Why, Ned? No, I know Mr. Twilling pretty well, and he just does not like good singing. Oh. He likes oh. to hear himself sing. He even likes to hear me sing, even though he couldn't stand me around the office anymore. Oh, <laughs> at that, you know, at that, he might like Queen's voice. Maybe it isn't as good as we think. Might have been better if Queena had stuck to her music lessons while she was in Venice instead of riding around in gondolas with you. Oh, my poor child. And so they were married. Married. Goodbye, my beautiful music. Goodbye to romance. It's gone out of our lives, Ned. My poor child. <laughs> Going on forever like this without any servants and not a stitch of clothing. <laughs> oh, well, now. Girl that had everything. 
Could have married a rich man and had more. Oh, really? It's now... too late now, Mama. Oh, Queen, you want to kill me. No, no, no. It's me she wants to kill. I'm the one who lost the job. I'm the good provider. Oh, Ned, you're cruel. No, no, Queen. No one is to blame. No, no one but myself. Now, but listen, Queen, Don't listen to another word, Queen, dear. Now, come on. Mr. Queen, no. well, suppose I were to tell you the twilling thought I had a beautiful voice that he wanted me to sing. I don't believe it. Oh, no? Down by the old mill street, oh, where man, I first met don't. you, with I'll say goodbye to music. Does it mean come to I won't listen, I won't. There I knew I'll that, that I loved but you. You had sung it you in the dark. You were sixteen by the village queen, by the old mill street. Oh, rats. Yes. What is it? Uh... I've given Queen her sleeping powder, and I'm going to take one myself. Good. I hope you enjoy yourselves. Glad the children aren't here to hear this row. They're sleeping over to Nellis's again. <laughs> Certainly is a new idea to have the children in bed at the neighbor's. Well, they insist on it. The dog goes to bed with them, and old Delia reads the Bible to them till they go to sleep. Mercy, I hope she's careful what she reads. Ned, what are you doing with Queena's apron? I'm mm-hmm. putting it on. Someone has to wash the dishes. Poor Queena. Spends half her life in the dishpan. Oh, oh, Ned, why don't you leave the dishes till morning? It's all right. I don't mind. Ned. Yeah? I wouldn't say this, Queena, but I think there's something in your voice. Huh? And if I were you, I'd go and see Mr. Twillin. Now, maybe you're a crooner without knowing it. A what? I mean it. You may be a born crooner. You know what they get. I know what they ought to get. Well, just an idea, Ned. Yeah, well, don't have any more. No. Well, good night, Ned. Oh, uh, Ned, will you telephone the Nellises not to come? Queen will ask them over for bridge in exchange for the children. All right. Hello, operator. Operator, 2414. That's right. Come on in. The door's open. Hello? Oh, hold it a minute, John. Well, your strange people are barging in. Is this 83 Sycamore Street? Yes. You want to have your number so someone can see it, George. I drove by this house three times. Well, drive by again. <laughs> Did you want anything? No. Thanks. Hello, John. No bridge tonight, old man. No queen has gone to bed. Oh, all tired out. A picnic tomorrow? You better count us out. You see, we had kind of a picnic tonight. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah. Good night. Is Mrs. Queen of Farrah at home? I'm Mrs. Stickney, her Aunt Mick. Oh, are you really? Yes. My chauffeur had the hardest time in finding this place. Your chauffeur? Oh, that's who that was. Isn't my niece here? I sent a telegram. A telegram? Oh, <laughs> well, one of the children must have got it first. Oh, you poor man. I suppose you have to look after the children, too, besides looking after the kitchen. Where is my niece? Well, she, she's out. And where is Mrs. Martin? Is she out, too? Well, yes, in a way, she is. She's <laughs> taken a sleeping powder and gone to bed. And Mr. Farrer, is he out with Mrs. Farrer? Oh, well, no, no, he's not. He, uh, but he won't be home until late. Well, right. there's your bags, Mum. Oh, is there a spare room? No, but you can have the children's room. Oh, I couldn't sleep with children. Well, <laughs> they're not in it. You see, they're staying with the neighbors. Mrs. Stickney, do you want me to take your bags upstairs, or is George here going to? George? Oh, oh. I'll take them up, Mrs. Stickney. Oh, thank you, George. Good night, Charlie. Good night, Mum. Good night. Would you like to go to your room, Mrs. Stickney? Uh, not just yet. I want to have a little talk with you. With me? Oh, really? Well, thank you. Uh, tell me, George, does Mr. Farrer usually stay out at night like this? Uh, no, no, no. You see, um, uh, he's just lost his job and he's out celebrating. Celebrating? Oh, well, I don't know, Mr. Farrer, but I'm qu- it's quite the sort of thing I should expect him to celebrate. Well, he hopes to get something better. And I suppose in the meantime, they'll have to let you go. Yeah. Oh, well, I, <laughs> I don't cost much, really. I, I'll give them my evenings until I get a job. Well, I must say that's very nice of you. George, do you ride horseback? Yes, I do, yes. And are you a good houseman? That's not the general opinion. I mean, I... Well, I I don't know really how good I am. Well, not that I like to go around stealing other people's servants, but I haven't got a houseman at my country place. And I think perhaps I'm making a mistake. 
If I could find the right man, I might seriously consider it. Oh, really? Well, that's a very good idea to have a man in the house. People might think him strong or a good shot or something, even if he weren't, huh? Exactly. <laughs> George, how would you like to come with me, say, in about a week, and just see how we get on? Well, I don't see how I could, really. I... Well, why not? You certainly won't be able to stay on here with Mr. Farrah out of a job and everything. Well, no, yes, yeah. I mean, well, that's just it. I, uh, I don't think it would be right for me to leave Mrs. Farrah at a time like this. You're a fine, loyal man, George. And I'm sure that Mrs. Farrah won't mind because I won't tell her about your coming with me. In fact, she won't even be here. I'm taking her home with me tomorrow morning. Oh, I didn't know that. Does she? No, but that's why I've come. The only way to make feet, Queen Anne, get a much-needed rest is to swoop down and carry her off suddenly like this. She's worn out, poor darling, and I don't wonder between living with her mother and that dreadful husband of hers. <clears throat> you understand, George. But, uh, but, uh, Mr. Farrah, how do you think he'll feel about it? Well, how can he feel if he's any consideration for her at all? He'd realize that she needs a vacation. Why, he ought to be glad I'm willing to take her with me for a few weeks, don't you think well, so? And I, I don't I, see I, how I, he can I, stand I, in her way now, I, do you? I, well, no, I guess not. Dear Aunt Min, oh, such a capable woman. As long as she insisted on taking Queena off my hands for a while, well, who was I to say her nay? Besides, I had my reasons. I sneaked out of the house early the next morning, and I gave Aunt Min a chance to take over. Oh, she certainly did. A week later, after I had taken care of a few details, I took Aunt Min up on that job she offered me. Well, so far it's all right. I arrived this morning. I took the old girl out for a canter in the woods. Everything was fine until I started to mend the screen on the sleeping porch. <gasps> Ned! How did you get here? Hello, Queena. Oh, I came up the ladder. I'm trying to mend the screen. Ned, you're the man Aunt Min's been raving about. Well, I guess I am, you see. The night that your aunt came to the house, she thought I was your houseboy. What? Yes. So I just let her keep on thinking it. And then she offered me this job. But, Ned, how could you do it? How could you leave Mama and the children? I thought you were home with them. Why hasn't she written you? Aunt Min doesn't let me have my letters. I'm having a rest cure. Well, you see, I gave the children to the Nellises. Gave the children? Yes, they like their house better than ours anyway. I... Oh. Oh, my darling, God, it's just temporary. Don't look like that. And Mama? Oh, I gave her away, too. What? <laughs> to Mr. Twilling, yes. To Mr. Twilling? Don't joke, Ned. I'm not, I'm not joking. Twilling needed a housekeeper, so I gave him your mother. What? Now, don't worry, Queena, don't worry. She's very happy. I telephone to Twilling every evening. Ah, oh, well, that's very nice of you, Ned. You know, I think you'd be very fond of Mama if she weren't my mother. Uh-huh. Well, I wouldn't say that, but I do want things to be all right with her, of course. Is the, uh, rest cure working? Oh, it's dreadful. Aunt Min makes me sleep out here on the porch just because she's a fresh air fiend. I nearly froze last night. And when I told Aunt Min, she said she'd have the screen mended. And it's lonely out here in the night, all alone. Well, Queena, look. With this ladder here, I'll be able to come up and keep you company tonight. Oh, Ned, I've missed you. If this squirrel oh. doesn't keep you warm, Queena. Oh, George, you're mending the screen. Well, I'm trying to, Mrs. Stickney, but I can't do any more now. I'm all out of tax. Well, very well then, George. You can get some more tomorrow. Yes, Mrs. Stickney. And George. Yes? Will you order the same horses from the livery stable for tomorrow? Oh, I'll try to pick some younger ones. Oh, but mine has such a lovely long tail. Well, I'll look for another with a longer one. Were you surprised to see George here, Queena? Indeed I was. I wanted to surprise you about George. I hope you don't mind my taking him right out of your house. But he certainly seems fitted for better things than the kitchen work you've had him doing. You're quite right, Aunt Min. He certainly does. Why, he's even working on something else right now. He won't say what it is. He wants to keep it a secret. But I know it's something big, and I'm giving him three days off every week so that he can attend to it. There's a man, Queen, who will amount to something. I certainly hope so, Aunt Min. Mrs. Stickney. Yes, Phoebe, what is it? It's your sister, ma'am, Mrs. Martin. She's here. Mama, here? Tell her to come in, Phoebe. Oh. Now, Queen, and I don't excite yourself. Did you know she was coming, Aunt Mary? Why, yes, of course. She telephoned this morning and was all upset about something. Oh. What, I don't know. You know how your mother is on the telephone. She ought never to use one. <laughs> oh, my baby. Oh, Mama. Well, Ellie? Uh, Mama, what's happened to you? You're all dressed up. Uh, well, in the first place, Ned has disappeared. Oh, good. 
Well, but before he disappeared, he sent the children to the Nellis's and got me a position as Mr. Twilling's housekeeper. Housekeeper? Oh, I was glad to take it, but I had no idea. Mama, what is the matter? Ellie, where did you get those pearls? Well, that's partly what's the matter. You see, Mr. Twilling is not the quiet, retiring old gentleman he seemed at all. Oh? He... He sent for a dressmaker almost the first thing and had her make me some house dresses. Oh, not the ordinary house dresses at all. They're made of lovely taffeta, must cost three, four dollars a yard. And then he began to want me to have dinner with him. Oh, ho. Sent to New York and had hats and suits sent out. This is one of them. And then he gave me these pearls, uh, just because I made waffles for him twice. Ellie, you mean you accepted all these things from this man? Well, I must say I can't understand it. Well, uh, he says that his grandfather, his father, knew Grandpa Min and cheated him out of a lot of money so that he owes me a um, lot more money than he'd ever be able to repay. I don't believe it. No one could cheat Grandpa. He was a splendid businessman. He could cheat anybody. <laughs> Mama, I think it's exciting. Oh, it's not all, Queen. Well, now, that's what I was afraid of. Go on, Ellie, and I'll get to the point, if there is one. Well, last night... Mr. Twilling asked me to marry him. Marry him? Why, he must be crazy. Mama, what are you going to do? Well, I'm not quite sure yet. But... Now, you've no mind for making decisions, Ellie Martin. I'll decide what's best for you to do. Now, you stay here tonight. You're not going back to that man's house. But men... Yes, you can only... sleep in the room that opens on this porch, and then you'll be right next to Queen. You, you mean Queen sleeps out here? Uh, why, yes, for well, the fresh air's doing her a world of good. But it's so cold, me. Queen is not used to sleeping out of doors. We've been poor, but we've always had a roof over our heads. Oh, I don't mind, Mama. Now I've got the squirrel coat. Coat? And... Oh, no, coat. I don't think she ought to sleep out here at this time of the year. There's a chill. In all here. right, Ellie, all right. I'll sleep out here myself. Oh! Yes, Queener can sleep in my but room. But I mean... Oh, not another word, Queen. It's all settled. I'll just tell Phoebe to move your things into my room. Oh, Mama, Mama, you don't know what you've done. <laughs> Darling. Oh, oh. Don't, don't be frightened, darling. Didn't you know I'd come to you? Poor little precious, all alone out here. Alone with the birds and the beasts of the forest. Sure. <laughs> oh, great Scott. Oh, Mrs. Stickney. Oh, what have I done? Oh, I'm... Oh, 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 I beg your pardon. Shh. George, you know I can't scream in my own house. Oh, gosh, you don't have to. Shh. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, good grief. Oh, oh I, I beg your pardon. Why did you do this, George? No, I, I must go, please, please. I'll explain some other time. I'm, please, I must go. George, be careful of that chair. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh I'm sorry, oh, please. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so oh, sorry, dear. really. I, oh, I had no idea. Dear. Yes, now, I don't... want to hide or something. Somebody, yes. They're coming out. They're coming out. Here, here. Yes. What? Min, what's the matter? Nothing, Ellie. Go back to bed. But I heard an awful noise, Min. There's a man out here. I see him. Nothing of the sort, Ellie. Where's the light? Quick, tell me where's the light. Oh, Ellie, stop this nonsense. Nonsense? Why, he's crouching over there in the corner. Oh, here's the light. Thank heaven. Mm -hmm. You see, Ellie, there's nothing in that corner but my sweater coat. I threw it over a stool. Stool? Nothing. Something's alive about that coat. And I know it isn't a squirrel's. It's moving. Oh, that's your astigmatism, Ellie. You don't know what you see without your glasses. Well, I know I heard an awful crash. What was it? I got up to pull the curtain so that the moonlight wouldn't come in, and I ran into the table and upset it. Now, turn out that light, Ellie, and go back to bed. Look here, me and the moon went down hours ago. It's practically sunrise. Turn that light out. Now, you go back to bed and shut that door and don't come out again, no matter what you hear. Really, me and... Oh, now, good night, Ellie. George, are you still there? I'm afraid so. George... Did you do this because of anything I said when we were out riding this afternoon? Oh, no, no, really. I, I came because... Well, you see, I, I thought... Stop Don't tell me now. Wait until tomorrow. I must be to blame in some way. I would rather think oh, so. Oh, but you don't understand. If you'd only let me... Be careful going down the ladder. It wouldn't look well. For me to break my neck. No, I won't. I won't. Now, go, George. Can you go quietly? Oh, heaven, I hope so. <laughs> Oh, what a night, what a night, what a night. Trapped on a screen porch with the wrong woman, passing myself off as a squirrel coat. Oh, what have I come to? What will Queena say? She knows that I've been a good and loving husband for ten years. That is, I hope she knows. 
I hope she doesn't think I just can't resist climbing up ladders. And Aunt Min, I don't have to worry about her getting me wrong. She has already. Oh, who am I, anyway? Am I Ned Farrer or George the Porch Climber? It's all getting very, very vague. Oh, dear, dear. What a night. What a night. This is Sickney. Did you send for me? No, Phoebe. It was George I wanted to see. Oh, well, he's still asleep, ma'am. Asleep at this hour of the morning? Yes, ma'am. And if you ask me, ma'am, he must have had a pretty wild night of it. And no one's asking you, Phoebe. When George wakes up, just tell him that I want to see him. Man, isn't it wonderful? Wonderful. Oh, That'll be all, Phoebe. Yes. <laughs> now, Ellie, what is it that's so wonderful? Well, he's, he's here, me, and he's come for me. Who's here? Murgatroyd. Murgatroyd? Who's he? Mr. Swelling. He just this minute got here in his car. Queen has gone out to meet him. I hope you're not seriously considering going off of this old lunatic. You've no right to make such a remark, man. At least Mr. Twinning never came sneaking into my room at two o'clock in the morning. Just what do you mean by that, Ellie? You know perfectly well what I mean, Min. I'm talking about last night, about the man under that squirrel coat. Mr. Twilling never got under a squirrel coat or anything of the sort. Ellie, do you think I had a rendezvous with a man who was on the porch last night? I don't know what you had, Min. But I can't understand why you didn't scream. Oh, Min, something wonderful has happened. Mr. Twilling's going to tell you all about it. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Stickney? I'm very much surprised, Mr. Twilling. Well, I should think you would be. We're all surprised, but, but perhaps you don't uh, know what I'm talking about. Yes, we know, Murgatroyd. You're talking about me. Oh, there you are, Ellie, hiding as usual. No, the great news is not about us. It's about Mrs. Stickney's hired man. <laughs> you mean George? I, I mean George. I hired him at the same time you did, but for a different purpose. To sing on the radio. To sing? On the radio, George. Yes, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. He sings under the name of Sylvester Silverton, the silver voice tenor. George is Sylvester Silverton. There, I knew it. To think George has a fortune in his voice, and you never suspected it. I did. I told him to go to see Mr. Twilling. I didn't, but his voice was the first thing I loved about him. Oh, what? Mercy, Queen. You told me not to say anything. <gasps> So, Queena, you're in love with him. Well, I begin to see it all now. Oh, I didn't mean to tell you. Uh, Murgatroyd isn't the car waiting. Now, yes. just a minute, Ellie. Do you know about this? Yes, of course I did, Min. We are going, Queena. Aren't you coming down to see us all? I'll be along in a minute, Mama. Well, we'll wait in the car. Don't be long, dear. Uh, but, Ellie. Goodbye, Min. Uh, goodbye, Mrs. Stakely. Please don't ask me about it, Aunt Min. I promised him I wouldn't say a word. He wants to tell you himself. Oh, but this explains everything about last night. He thought you were on the sleeping porch. You've been having a romance with George. Much more than that. But I don't see how there can be much more than that. <laughs> but really, you don't understand. Phoebe said you wanted to see me, Mrs. Stickney. Oh, here he is. <laughs> yes, uh, come right in, George. Oh, Mama's leaving. You'll have to excuse me, Aunt Min. He'll explain everything. Oh, well, now, now look here, look here. Well, you see, Mrs. Stickney... Now, don't bother, George. I know your secret. Mr. Twilling told me. Now you're going to make a fortune, aren't you? Well, I suppose so. Is there uh, anything else you have to tell me? When you said you knew my secret, I thought perhaps you meant something else. I thought perhaps you knew about Queena and me. Yes, I know about that, too. She told me. Oh, what a tragic love. Well, then you understand about last night that I came because... Yes, uh, I know. I thought she was cold and uh, frightened. I can't blame Queena, really. Her life shattered by a worthless husband. And then you, so fine, so sensitive, so romantic. Oh, I see. You don't know everything. Is there more? Oh, yes, there's much more. Why, you don't know the half of it. What is it, George? I can bear anything now. Well, mainly that my name isn't George. No. Now, now, you must be brave. Now, prepare. Prepare for the worst. Brace yourself. I am Ned Farrer. Ned Farrer? Yes. Well, I don't believe it. Does Queena know it? I mean, it isn't possible. Oh, yes, it is. It is indeed. I've been all the time. Oh, oh, I, I don't know how I feel about this. Well, of course not. And the worst of it is that now I've gotten awfully fond of you. Oh, Oh, well, but you and Queena will go off and leave me the way Ellie did. Still, I have a great deal to live for. I always wanted to get round to draining the pond and putting up the memorial window for Grandpa. Oh, nonsense. The idea of you talking like that. Why, Aunt Lynn, I can kiss you now that we're related, can't I? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to last night. <laughs> And I wanted you to. Oh, 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 oh. well, uh, uh, uh. 
there. Now, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Horton, Miss Watson, and Miss Patterson, for a fine interpretation of one of my favorite comedies. I could tell from your enthusiasm that you enjoyed playing it. Next week, we are going to add romantic music to our drama and give you... But first, let's hear from Larry Elliott. Somewhere above America right now, giant passenger airliners are soaring smoothly, serenely, powerfully through space. To enjoy that smooth flying effect when driving your car... That would be downright luxury, wouldn't it? Well, today you can. Yes, come the closest to it you ever have with Sky Chief, Texaco's new premium gasoline. You'll find that out the instant you start your car, in the powerful, almost silent way your engine flows into action, in the smooth, brilliant response of your car as you glide from first to second to high. For Sky Chief literally gives wings to wheels. It's the nearest thing to flying power in ground travel. New, different, Sky Chief is truly a gasoline for those who want the best. And yet, it costs no more than other premium gasolines. You'll find it in the pump next to popular priced Fire Chief at your neighborhood Texaco dealer. And here's Mr. Mantle with news of next week's stars and play. Next week's play will be Lynn Riggs' Green Grow the Lilacs, with John Bowles as a happy cowhand and June Walker playing her original role of Laurie Williams. Green Grow the Lilacs was a theater guild success a few years ago, and was later taken successfully on tour. Mr. Riggs is a poet of the prairies, of whom it has been written that he hymns the friendliness of his neighbors and the gorgeousness of nature. I hope you will all be with us next week at this time. The Texas Company now takes pleasure in delivering a message on behalf of the entire petroleum industry. From the laboratories of the petroleum industry comes the amazing prediction that within our lifetime, articles such as paper, textiles, even food may be made from crude oil, the same source from which comes the gasoline that runs the car. But that's a thought for tomorrow. Here's one for today that shows how these same oil scientists are conserving one of the natural resources that have made America great. Once, a barrel of crude oil yielded about 20% gasoline. Today, by scientific refining methods, more than double that amount of gasoline is obtained. Thus, the petroleum industry, through its research and scientific methods, is protecting our heritage of oil, is constantly serving not only you as an individual, but America as a whole. Next week, Texaco dealers from coast to coast invite you to be their guests again in the Texaco Star Theater, where from Hollywood, you will hear Ken Murray, your master of ceremonies, Francis Langford, Kenny Baker, Irene of Tim and Irene, Jimmy Wallington, Tom Mix as guest star, and the Texaco Orchestra directed by David Brookman. From New York, the Texaco Star Theater brings you John Bowles and June Walker, starring in the romantic drama Green Grow the Lilacs, one full hour of complete entertainment. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast. Kenny Baker appeared on this program through the courtesy of Mervyn Leroy Productions. The original music for her master's voice was written and conducted by Lehman Ingle. This is the Columbia Broadcasting...